Genesis chapter 6. We're going to look at some verses there. As believers, we face a big challenge, if you think of it. We know that the Scripture tells us, teaches us, that we are to live godly, right? We know that. Now, here's where the challenge comes in. We are to live godly in a world that is far from godly. That's why I said it's a challenge. How do we do that? Now, obviously, the ultimate model would be the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's a little difficult for us to relate to sometimes because even though he was a man, we tend to focus more on the fact that he was God. And it's almost like in the back of our mind, we feel like, well, it wasn't any problem for him. So what if we could come up with someone else? Someone that was just a mortal human being. Just like us. Someone that was born in sin. Just like us. I think this chapter gives us a great model. The man's name? Noah. Noah. Noah shows us the secret to living right in a world that isn't. And there are three things we'll move quickly on. Three things that we must have if we're going to be able to live godly in a world that isn't. First, it's imperative that we be forgiven. Forgiven. Here in Genesis 6, look at verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Stop. Now the meaning of grace here is very, very important. It actually means favor. It means acceptance. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God was looking down out of heaven. And the world was wicked because we know what's going to happen. Just bring up the subject of Noah. But there was Noah. And God was gracious to him. Why? Did God just pick him out? Actually, he did. But there's a reason he did. And we'll get to that in the second point. Right now, just suffice to say that God was gracious to Noah. It's receiving something that we don't deserve. Noah did not deserve what he received from God. And we are such a picture of that. Remember, we're talking about how to live godly in a world that isn't. We must be forgiven, saved. Paul explains it beautifully. In Ephesians chapter 2, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should 
boast. So I think the absolutely fundamental first step in living godly in a world that isn't is that we must be saved. We must be forgiven. Second, we also must be faithful. Faithful. Again, what a picture Noah paints. Look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Three things. And we'll move through them quickly. First, we are told that he was just. What's that mean? It literally means that he was righteous in both his character and his conduct. Noah stood out. He was different. And by the way, one of those words that we use often in Christian speech is the word justified, right? Justification. Just. It's the same word that's using here. Noah was just. He was just. Then he said he was perfect. He was perfect. Did that mean that he was sinless? No. Of course not. Oft times in Scripture, and we use this a lot, this is not the only place you'll find it, it's in Scripture both in the Old Testament and New Testament. It talks about someone being perfect, and it literally means someone who is complete. They are complete. He was complete in his integrity and his lifestyle. You see where we're going with this? When he was just, it meant in his character and his conduct, he exemplified what God would desire. But also in his integrity and his lifestyle. If Noah told you something, you could count on it. He would be faithful. He would never lie to you. If you had done a business transaction with Noah, you would never have had to worry about him cheating you in any way. But perhaps one of the most beautiful things is the last part. It says that he walked with God. He walked with God. And if you go all the way back to the early part of this Genesis book, we read that God would come down in His presence. God is the Spirit. He would come down in the evening and he, it says He would walk. He would walk with Adam and Eve. It's just like a beautiful stroll in the evening. And I think that that's a picture of what we see here with Noah, but it goes beyond that. It implies someone who was totally obedient. By the way, do you know when the walk stopped? That stroll that God came down and had with Adam and Eve you know when it stopped? When they disobeyed God. There's no indication whatsoever. Innocence. That was how they were created. They were created in innocence. But they had a responsibility to God. You can enjoy this beautiful place. There is one thing you must not do. And that's the very thing they did. So they disobeyed. God. And in this picture, when it says that Noah walked with God, 
It just implies that he was totally obedient. You know, I really don't have to try to wrap my brain around that. The man is going to build a vessel because God told him he was going to send rain and it would raise to such epic size that it would destroy all the living upon the earth except Noah and his family and those animals that were taken into the ark. It had never rained. But God gave Noah all of the plans for the ark told him everything he was to do. And Noah went to work. And he did this with just the most primitive of tools, all that he had, not with all the things that we have today. And he worked on this thing months and months and months and months. But he had a side job. It was working on the boat. His number one job was warning people. He was perhaps the first bivocational preacher. Every opportunity he had, he preached to people. God is not pleased. He's going to destroy the earth. You better have a relationship with him. must be forgiven, must be faithful. Let me give you one more. We should be fruitful. Look at verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, <clears throat> that's interesting. The word begat speaks of the fathering of, of three sons. So Noah's being obedient. Go out, be fruitful, multiply, right? Noah's being obedient. We've already discussed that. But here was the thing that intrigued me about this fruitfulness thing. Do you suppose, and we have no way of knowing, do you suppose that in his Quite time, Noah thought God is going to destroy this world because of its sinfulness. And I'm going to bring three children into this wicked world. I don't know if he thought of that or not. I have no idea. I am going to be honest and tell you this. I've heard people talk about that in this day. About bringing little children into a world. And if we think it's wicked now, and it is, there's every reason to believe that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I've been around over seven decades. So I don't have a whole lot of time that's in God's hands. I probably don't have a lot of time left. I don't have any idea that I'll see just how wicked this world is going to get. But I have children and grandchildren and a great grandchild. And I wonder sometimes what they're going to go through. And it can be scary. But the obedience of Noah was so great that he did the thing that God said must happen. And get this. Had Noah not been fruitful, 
There's every reason to believe that man would have just totally been destroyed from the face of the earth. Think about it. We wouldn't be here had it not been for the fruitfulness of Noah. So, be forgiven. Be forgiven. We talked about the world being wicked. I would not want to consider one day living in this world without being saved. Be forgiven. Be faithful. Be faithful. Walk with God. And that faithfulness will lead us to be fruitful. Amen? That's how to live in a wicked world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.